optics. We'll start with mirrors, a reflective surface. A beam of light coming into that reflective surface and exiting out of that reflective surface because it doesn't go into the surface because it's reflective. We call them the incident ray and the reflected ray, and we measure those rays, the angle of those rays with respect to the normal line, the normal line, a line perpendicular to and away from the reflective surface. The angle of incidence is measured like this, the angle of reflection is measured like this, and they are equal to one another. The law of reflection states that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, and this is why you can see an object in a mirror. Here we have rays of light coming from that object, bouncing off the mirror and entering into the eyeball. Each of those three rays obeys the law of reflection, but your eye, your eye doesn't know that. Your eye's kind of stupid. Your eye's been told that light travels in a straight line, and you know what? I believed it. And then when I trace those lines backwards, I get to a virtual image. That virtual image, that virtual person that you saw this morning brushing their teeth inside of the medicine cabinet which was kind of weird and unsettling, and so is this question, in order that you are able to see yourself in a full-length mirror. How big does the mirror have to be? Well, the answer is one-half your height. This mirror and these rays, I hope they convince you, but this mirror will allow you to see your shoes, even if this mirror is only half as tall as you are. Ray of light from the shoe bounces off the mirror. Okay, I believe it. So much for reflection. How about refraction? Again, an incident ray, this time not going into a reflective surface, but into a cup of water. Or how about a glass? How about a lens? More on that later. Here we have a ray going into a new medium. Light changes direction as it enters a new medium. That is refraction, and you guessed it once again. We are measuring the angle of the incident ray and the angle of the refracted ray with respect to the normal line, the line perpendicular to and away from the surface. This time the equation is a little bit more complicated. It's Snell's Law. And the index of refraction for the first medium times sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. And you could work out the details for a specific problem, but the principle is this. The light changes direction when it enters a new medium. And notice in all these examples that the ray of light has bent towards the normal. It's been bent towards the normal because the index of refraction of the glass or the water or whatever it is, is greater than the index of refraction of the air. The ray of light has bent towards the normal, but that's a problem. Can you think of what the problem is? The problem is what if the light comes from inside the glass or inside the water? Again, Snell's law says that the angle will change. This time we are being refracted away from the normal line, away from the normal line, and that's the problem. At a particular angle, you're as, as far away from the normal line as you can possibly get. That's called the critical angle, where the index of refraction of the outside material divided by the index of refraction of the inside of the material. And then you take an arc sign, and you get a critical angle, and what happens if you... If you increase the angle a little bit more, well, you get total internal reflection, called total internal reflection. Fun fact, but not that important when you're stranded on a deserted island and you're trying to spear a fish. This guy is stranded on a deserted island and trying to spear a fish. So the question is, where do you throw the spear? And the answer is, below the fish. You throw the spear below what you think is the fish. See, the real fish is the one on the bottom. The real fish is the one on the bottom, and then a ray of light comes up from that fish, exits the water, and is refracted away from the normal. And then your eye, your, your eye is kind of foolish. Your eye thinks that light travels in a straight line, so the fish you see is not really where the fish really is, which is kind of why somebody's standing in the pool of water, their legs can look kind of shorter than they really should be sometimes. Anyway, let's talk about lenses convex converging lenses and concave diverging lenses and here we have an object on the left and the lens in the center and one of our three principal rays this ray is coming in parallel to the principal axis that's the black line through the center of everything anyway this is a ray that comes parallel to that principal axis and is refracted through the focal point see that dot with an f next to it this ray is refracted through the focal point a converging lens causes this ray to go through the focal point this ray comes through the focal point and is refracted to go parallel the principal axis we have two of our three 
principal rays here. Here's the third one right through the center of everything. And that blue upside down arrow is your real image before we had the mirror and a virtual image because the rays of light didn't really get there. This time the rays of light really are getting there. And if you change the position of the object or if you change the focal length of the lens or change the position of the object, which is easier for me to do here, <laughs> you'll get different locations for your image and different sizes and that's given by this equation or I like this form of the same equation I can never forget this equation never I can never forget it because if I do I die get it that's f the focal length do the distance to the object di the distance to the image distance to object and distance to image also determine the magnification of the object that's a converging lens. How about a diverging lens? A diverging lens is a little bit different and a little bit the same. It's a little bit different because it diverges. It's a little bit the same because in this case, we have that ray that starts out parallel to the principal axis and is diverged away from the focal point. These ray diagrams can be a little bit of a chore to draw, but you draw that other ray, this one through the center of the lens, and you get a upright virtual image. To review, a converging lens can create a real image. And there it is. You can do this with a candle and a magnifying glass. Project an image on a piece of paper. A converging lens can create a real image. A diverging lens cannot create a real image because the rays diverge. But if the object gets too close to the converging lens, it creates a virtual image. Compare this with a diverging lens. That's why you call one a magnifying glass and the other, that's what my eyeglasses look like. They make the world a little bit smaller. More on eyeglasses a little bit later. And what's true for lenses? The same equations work for mirrors. Here we have a concave converging mirror and a convex diverging mirror. Here we have a real inverted image created with a concave mirror. Look at those rays parallel the principal axis through the focal point. Good stuff. Here we have a upright, demagnified, virtual image in the back of a spoon. Look at yourself in the back of a spoon. You're smaller if you look in the back of the spoon. What about optical instruments? Say you can't see your spoon because you need eyeglasses. Why is that? Well, here's the eyeball. A lens focusing light on your retina. And that lens has got to change itself, change its shape in order to see near things and far things, both in focus. Now, I'm a little bit nearsighted. That means I can see things that are close by, but when I see things that are farther away, that's a little bit of a problem for me. I need to correct that with a concave lens. That concave lens spreads the light out a little bit, so instead of being focused in the wrong place, the light comes together in the right place. If you're farsighted, which means you can see far away, but seeing up close, up close things are hard to focus on, then you can fix that with a convex lens, which can help your eye push those beams of light closer together. And if it's true for an eye, it should be true for a telescope and a microscope, which in a way do totally different things, but in a way do kind of the same sort of thing. They help you see with higher resolution. They take something that would otherwise be kind of small and blurry, and make it bigger, but most importantly, make it clearer. A telescope is collecting light with the objective lens and concentrates it in the eyepiece lens. And the ray diagrams before were complicated. These are even worse. But the idea here is that the image, the real image from that first lens, becomes the object. The object for the second lens, and you can see the tree from far away, or you can see the ant bigger than you probably want to.